How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody had fun last night? I know I did. Lots of good conversation. Awesome. Well, this morning, a quick little background. CMO lead is kind of a weird title. Uh, I'm here to talk a, about really building a much more customer-centered content strategy as, as we go through this here today. CMO lead at Microsoft, what on earth does that mean? Uh, it means I am Microsoft's primary evangelist to marketers. I do a lot of co-creation with our customers. I advise our digital agencies. I look at everything from Bing advertising to artificial intelligence and have to understand how everything fits together in kind of the marketing mosaic, I guess you could say. So I have a really fun job. Um, I also teach marketing for UC Irvine and sit on several boards of marketing. So a lot of fun, try to steepen this stuff as much as I can. I wanted to start with my personal philosophy when it comes to marketing that every single touch point with a customer is marketing. The reason I say that is from the first time that they hear about your product through word of mouth, or they see an ad, or they see your content, it goes all the way through to the sales cycle, and was there friction, and how easy was that, to the onboarding, and what was their time to value, and did they actually get activated and start to realize value with your products, to if there's a problem. And all of those impact whether or not they're going to talk about your brand in a positive or negative light and whether or not they're going to recommend it. And so we as marketers have a unique perspective of being able to step up and own that and, and journey. It doesn't just stop at lead generation. Why is this important? Why am I kind of a customer experience advocate, crusader, whatever you want to call it? It's because it's becoming a real core differentiator for brands. We, there have been several studies coming out here that customer experience is going to become a core differentiator, either what people are perceiving your customer experience to be or what they've actually experienced it as and they're telling other people about. It's actually becoming, it's going to overtake price and product as a key brand differentiator for companies here in the next couple years. So if you're not already thinking about it, then you're, you get started today. I have a quick question, quick raise of hands. How many of you have taken your end-to-end -end customer journey? I've got maybe five, six hands in the room. Point, right? Just look at that right there. How many of you with the hands up have taken it in the last three months? I got one, two, three. Okay, so it's really important and why I'm here today to bring a little bit of a marketing intervention. We say customer experience is so important, yet almost no one has gone through theirs as we look at that. Why is this important? Why are we looking at this? When's the last time you had a bad customer experience? I had one flying out here, right? Airlines are notorious for that. And why is this so important? It's because we all still suck at customer experience. Right? We have so much data that's supposed to make us good at this, right? You've got email, you've got social, you've got predictive, you've got intent, you've got all these data points, yet we still suck at customer experience. There's all these tools, right, and I'm waiting for the next one of these to come out here soon, right, that are supposed to help us with our marketing. Yet, every time we add a new tool, we add more data, we add more silos, and that leads to dashboards. And we've all done that, right? Dashboards lead to analysts, which lead to costs, which still has not worked. We still suck at customer experience. So now is a little bit of a marketing realization, a marketing reckoning. It's time to really talk about how you approach transformation in your companies. And I'm here to say, it's not gonna be the most popular thing with the vendors in the room, but technology alone is not the answer. Transformation is part technology. You gotta get your processes as dialed in on that, and part culture. If you don't have these three things, you will fail. And the problem with us as marketers is we have shiny object syndrome. Right? We're always looking for that next silver bullet. First it was pay-per-click, then it was SEO. It just gotta be number one on Google. Right, the Microsoft guy said Google. <gasps> um, <laughs> then it was email marketing, right? And then marketing automation. And these were all the things we were chasing. Then it was content marketing, content is king. Now we're at account-based marketing, right? You've heard more than, you're probably thrown up because you've heard it so much at this conference, right? And then predictive and intense, right? These are all the next thing that you need to solve your problems. These are all legitimate strategies. These are all legitimate tactics. But one of our problems is we need to mature in where we are today with the tools that we have and realize the value that we have behind that and focus on customer experience. There is no core silver bullet that's gonna solve all of your problems. So getting into kind of where we're headed with the journey, I wanted to start with kind of a fundamental question. What is that journey as we go through it? A lot of us have a product-centric view of the world as we look at these with our companies, right? Most of us have a funnel in some way, shape, or form as we go through this. 
We at Microsoft, we've adopted a couple of serious decisions frameworks as well, and you can find a lot of these great solutions that are out there, different customer journeys as they go through these different items here, right? But you define your process where somebody is today, I'm gonna hit them with challenger marketing, whatever it is, right, and I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna move them down this funnel. But the problem is the journey's changed. The journey has gotten a lot bigger than we think it has, right? We now have things like in-product social and onboarding content that we as marketers need to look at. We need to think about key activation points as we're going through that. There's chatbots, right? This is going to be an incredible new wave of brand interaction that we need to be thinking about as marketers. These chatbots have an incredible ability to understand the questions our customers are asking, search the biggest knowledge databases in the world that our companies have, and return an answer that actually makes sense. Like, this is going to become a core way that we have to start thinking about this as a touch point in our journey. Right? We've got these new sales technologies coming out there like Sales Navigator and all these other ones that are coming out to the forefront. And when is the right time to interject that into the customer journey? What's the right time to have that sales team reach out and with what content in that context? Right? We have AI coming on this. How many of you guys know about Tay? Okay, good. All right, so Tay is a Microsoft research project. Tay, a little background, is a Twitter AI bot that was basically persona to be a 13-year-old girl who'd never really seen the world. Um, so Tay came to Twitter, and Tay was really sweet. And then Twitter got a hold of Tay. This is the nicest thing I could find. Tay became a Hitler-loving, bigoted, swearing, artificial intelligent bot, and Tay's offline. <laughs> Right? But I say this because AI is very much so becoming a reality. We're going to start facing more and more in the next coming years. Not a silver bullet again, but something we need to be thinking about in context of where and when do we want these touch points to engage with our customers as we go through that. We need to be looking across the end-to-end -end journey, not just up to lead generation as a business. So the first thing's first. I'm going to get a little academic here. Uh, I do this with my students on every single class. Who is my customer? It's a really fundamental question, but I'm amazed by how many people don't actually know the answer uh, to that as we go through it. And so one of the first things I make all my students do is really zeroing in on who your customer is. And we typically approach this through personas. Now, some of you are like, oh, personas, that's so old school. The reality is you can do this with phenomenal technology. A lot of great vendors in here help you des design those profiles, but not everybody has access to those right? and, and that capability. So you can also build this out by hand. You also have to take a look at this. Are you a product-centric company or a customer-centric company? Are you building a product and finding a market that fits it? Or are you taking a look at the market needs and things like that and then building your product to address that? So that's core and kind of fundamental from that. I'll give you some examples of, of what we did here. Uh, some of the work we were doing at Microsoft was looking at, you know, as we were targeting marketers, a lot of you guys target marketers with, with what you're doing. And, oh, I sell to marketers. That's my persona. No, the marketing department's huge, right? And you have to zero in on this and start to really understand all these different people and how they fit together. And that can quickly get overwhelming. So we took it and we said, OK, what are those core functions, those dark blue areas in there? And then we zeroed in. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on how to build a great persona, because there were great courses and sessions on that. But we went through and really zeroed in on things like, what are their responsibilities? Where do they fit into the hierarchy of the entire organization that I'm selling into? Uh, what are their challenges? And not only what are their challenges for the business, what are their challenges as a person? Is it, if I don't get this answer, I'm gonna lose my job. I wanna get promoted. I wanna be home by 6 p.m. so I can have dinner with my family more regularly. What are those things that motivate them to push forward? And we look at things like conversation starters and purchasing insights. And then the most important thing that's part of this persona process that a lot of us skip is looking at, now that I know who this individual is, where on earth do they go to get their content? Where do they read? What channels are they on, right? I can go and guess and be like, I need to be on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, right? But maybe they're on Reddit, and you don't need to be on Twitter, right? You need to look at all of these different channels. There's not a right bundle. There's some that cover such a great scope. We should be, we definitely will be on them, but we need to go and look at what channels are they on? Where do they get their information? And once we have that bit, we need to actually look at what kind of content do they engage with as a part of that, right? There's this, all this research can be done manually and with technology, so it's not unreachable for the small businesses in the room. But really zeroing in on who my customer is, where they get from their information, and what kind of content do they engage with on that. The next is to really identify that total addressable market as you go through this. 
So TAM, you know, the whole world, and then you've got your sub-segment, and then you've got, yeah, my target market. I view it a little bit differently um, from TAM all up. You've got your total addressable market, and you have those that are not a good fit, period. It might be because of geo, it might be because of culture, it might be because of language, right? There's just a group that's just not gonna be a good fit for you right now. Then you have those that are a fit, and we have those that are actively engaged. Out of those engaged, you have, these are my customers, right? They're obviously a good fit, they bought from me. I have my competitor's customers, they're obviously a good fit, they bought from my competitor. I have those that I don't know about. This is a concept called um, unconscious incompetence. Essentially, I don't know what I don't know, right? There's all these businesses that are forming, they're up and coming, they might soon enter your total addressable market. It's a constantly changing and dynamic set of businesses as you're going through that. Then we have those that you're gonna find through traditional marketing, right, your inbound, outbound, all that kind of work. And then you have this little sliver, I couldn't make it really small enough, I wanted you guys to see it, but that are actively looking, right? You've heard a lot about intent at this conference. So how do we reach these, right? Well, we've got our kind of our general air cover in that customer journey as we're going through that. Uh, again, we've got things where we can be doing predictive lead gen with ABM. We've got uh, to your customers, you should be doing things like loyalty, education, expansion marketing inside of that. If you're not thinking about expansion and loyalty marketing to keep those customers, that's a huge area you should be investing in. For your competitors' customers, there's a thing I actually don't see a lot of companies doing. They leave this to their sales reps to try to unseat their competition, but really doing dissatisfaction and value campaigns to start seeding seeds of doubt about uh, your, your competitors and, and those customers you want to get into. Then, right, we've got ABM with intent detection. Pending the size of your company and your maturity, you may not be able to take advantage of all of these, but actually having the view and knowing that you have customers who fit inside of these different boxes is a very smart way to think about it. And each one of these has a slightly different journey. The last one I'll call out that a lot of people don't talk about, and we can do some of this stuff in the world's most adopted marketing technology everywhere called Excel. Um, <laughs> is your big fish, right? This is those where you're like, I want to be in these five accounts, right? You can do targeted planning, targeted ABM, really zeroed campaigns around those. You might want to unseat your competitors, lighthouse customer, right? Things like that and, and win them over from that perspective. So the way I look at TAM is a bit different and each one of these has a, a, an approach that you can take to it. And I just touched on it here briefly. The next is really defining your customer journey as a part of this as well. So there are frameworks. If you haven't done one yet, hopefully you have at least some baseline of what your customer journey is, but there are frameworks you can adopt. There are great ones from Forrester and Gartner and Sirius and all of the different analyst firms, right? Um, we at Microsoft undertook a three-year study, 12,000 data points across the globe. It was blind, so people didn't know that it was Microsoft doing the study. And we wanted to understand how do people just make purchasing decisions, period. And we actually found that there are five distinct stages to the purchasing cycle that they went through. The first was this open to possibility stage, which this is just this general, I have something in place or at the status quo, and I'm learning about everything else that's going on. I'll use a TV for example in this. So I have a TV today, it's great, it's seven years old, it's a flat screen, it works just fine. But I know and I'm learning about all these other TVs that are out there and available today. Um, I'm learning, you're coming to conferences like this, you're learning about new products and technology that you have today, et cetera, that are available to you. During this process, we slowly drip the seeds of dissatisfaction. We build up that, that kind of tension that I need something different. And then we hit this point. There's a catalyst, a tipping point, a decision to change, right? In, in my TV story, it could be maybe I got a bonus. Maybe I moved. Maybe I handed my son a golf ball and he threw it into it so I can finally get a new TV. Um, right? It's the, what is that catalyst? What is that decision to change? that you're gonna, it's a core signal that you need to be able to identify. And in our world, it can be things like a leadership change. It can be, uh, was there an uptick or a downtick in the market, right? There's all kinds of different things that can drive that catalyst right there. Then you get into the evaluate, and this is where that uh, inbound content, education, nurture, all this stuff is so important because you're evaluating all the different aspects of what's available. And we get to shopping, which is where I'm really zeroed in on my last couple choices. And this is actually where things like your sales and how they show up and the friction and how difficult it actually is to give you my money comes into this process here. And the last is experiencing. But experiencing, yes, it's your experience with the product and onboarding, but actually what it comes down to is what does your peer group and community say about your decision? Right? Anybody actually know what a Daewoo is? I might be dating myself a little bit on that. Uh, it's kind of the idea of if you bought a, a Daewoo versus a Toyota. If you buy a Daewoo and it breaks down, your friend's like, yeah, what'd you expect? That's a terrible car. Right? Versus if you buy a Toyota and it breaks down, people groan with you. Man, you made a smart decision that shouldn't have happened. 
right? And we see this even in this world, right? There's, there's MarTech that you will purchase that you would never get in trouble for, you'll never get fired for because it's kind of the standard, right? Versus there's that net new stuff that you might be taking a risk on and what's your peer group gonna say if it doesn't work? Uh, so that experiencing is that feedback to us as we go through that. This is one we also use at Microsoft, another serious one here, just where we map the persona to the journey and then map content over it. This is something you definitely should uh, do with whatever framework you have, but taking your personas, overlaying it with the journey, taking your existing content that you have today and flowing through that. I wanted to talk kind of some about these different stages as well that we're going through on this journey. Uh, when we're really trying to get more customer centric. We have kind of ground cover, air cover, I've heard it called a hundred different things, but essentially this is hitting on that uh, open to possibility stage, right? This is where you're educating people before they know they have a need that's going on, right? This is social, we're doing stunts. I, I view this kind of like trolling as we're going through this, but not that kind, um, this kind of trolling um, as we go through that, right? I'm, I'm just, I might pick up a couple things behind me as I'm going through, but this is just that general awareness, putting seeds of doubt, of dissatisfaction, right? Those kinds of things. This is where we see stunts, like we're seeing with Snapchat right now. With us, we landed Santa Claus on Virgin Atlantic's new Dreamliner, um, right? Things to drive PR, just awareness, general pickup. Uh, a swag is actually a big thing in this category, but um, like things like backpacks, every brand impression you get. A big thing I'm a fan of and I push on my sales team is um, like laptop screens, because every time you're up talking, right, that's a brand impression. Every time they're at a coffee shop, that's a brand impression, right? So these kinds of things where we're, where we're targeting people. Then we have advertising, right? We got AdWords, Google AdWords, we've got um, predictive advertising, right? New thing, ooh. Uh, but also we can run dissatisfaction campaigns and we can also do ABM targeted advertising. So where does this fit into the journey and how do we really insert that so that it's adding value as we go through these different processes? Then we have conversion content and retargeting is another big part we have to plug into this journey and think about how we do it in an honest way. I got a couple examples here. So we, we have two core content methodologies we adopted at, uh, at Microsoft. First is a concept called Big Rock, um, which is from Jason Miller, LinkedIn, um, former Marketo guy. And it's the idea that you build one big piece of content and then you subdivide it into a bunch of little pieces and you use that to fuel everything into your gated content on this. So we built out these e-magazines, they have infographics, they break into a bunch of different articles, we gate the big deeper pieces on that, we call them deep dives. And we designed it as a magazine, so you're not gonna read the whole thing, you're gonna read what's interesting, but because I can tell what you're reading and what articles you're highlighting, I can actually tell what you're interested in and what products and nurture, et cetera, I should follow up with you on because the magazine gives me that perspective into everything that I can potentially offer to you. The big thing on this too, though, is every piece of content, and I'm a firm believer of this, everything <laughs> that we do in content marketing should deliver value. If you read a piece of content and you don't buy my product, you should still leave a better person and better educated than you did before you read that piece of content, right? I feel like we as marketers are often kind of seen as a cheap salesman, we're kind of like, yeah, I really want you to do this action, right? And, and that's not honest, that's not authentic, that's not delivering value, and your customers can tell when that's what you're trying to do. The other thing, the other model that we take is this concept of earthquakes, where we have these big epicenter pieces of content, and we have kind of these vibrations that go in, and then we have um, our aftershock from that, which is our nurture and demand and things like that. This was a digital assessment we did with retargeting uh, to a report if somebody didn't convert on that side, and how would we drive it from advertising to um, all the different blogs, how we plugged in our social selling and how that was gonna feed into that as well. Uh, and then our advertising and kind of pulling out in our, and then once they converted, we looked at it and we had different nurture routes of based on your company type and what you said in the report, you might just get a direct proposal, you might go to Tele, you might go to your account manager, depending on the size of account, because we work with a lot of big, different companies across the globe. The other big piece that a lot of people are not taking a look at in context of their journey right now is things like personalization and real-time personalization, right? We have all this phenomenal data uh, in the world around us, right? We have industry, we've got location, we've got their digital behavior. You guys have heard a lot about this. And we can do real-time personalization now in web, in email, in social. Our bots and AI can start to do those kinds of things. Uh, when people come to our sites and start to engage with us, it can be automatically learning and prompting them with content based on their behavior. And I'm finding a lot of companies haven't even really started to scratch the surface on this, and yet they're looking for that next shiny object. Right? Even, even though this is something that you can start doing today in context of that, a lot of great vendors um, can help with that. And even so, you can do some very simple aspects on that as well, even around your nurture marketing, uh, where you really should be looking at personalization and branching. 
on this as well. I know for some of you, you're like, that was like, I'm already doing that. I've been doing that for five years. You'd be amazed how many people are still using their Marketo Eloquan advanced marketing automation system just to do a newsletter blast every month, and that's about it. Or they'll have a linear nurture stream, and that's it, right? And they're not taking full advantage of the investment that they've made, and their customers are suffering because of it. This is an example of one. So based on the content you converted on, we would then drip you into an email based on how you engage with that. We would then branch you into different pieces. And then you'd get different, again, each based on your behavior, you'd get a different piece of content uh, or a different email follow-up piece. And by the end, I could tell exactly what you were interested in and who I should connect you with to sell to because of the behavior that you were taking. But I gave you the opportunity. And everything that you got was educating you and helping to convince you that you needed what we were eventually going to target you with. I have a little bit of a challenge for those of you in the room. If you have not started, if your only personalization is Dear Jeff in your emails, or if you haven't even done simple uh, image kind of personalization based on industry, based on location, whatever's important for your company, right? We have IP address and all kinds of stuff. We can detect that. Or have simple paragraphs that you swap out based on for personalization, just very simple, like have five. Have five images and five paragraphs that you swap out, and the bulk of it can all be the same. Take your training wheels off, people. Right? Deliver the value to your customers that they need. You might get some scratches along the way, but once you take them off, you're never going to go back. And your customers are going to love you for it because you're not going to get this standard kind of BS that we're getting today from a lot of companies that are out there. So take your training wheels off. Last kind of piece, and I'm not going to go deep on this, is, is this account-based marketing bit. And, right, and I view this as kind of there's four key account-based marketing strategies that you can take. The first is that plan, right? those big fish that I want to go after and build a big executing plan around them. I've got the expansion marketing in my existing customers and how I'm going to expand inside of them and what does that look like. That might be loyalty. For us, it's driving DAO and MAL, daily active users, monthly active users. If you're SaaS, that's absolutely important. Um, Another big piece that we look at on an expansion are finding those key activation points that tells me somebody's not going to churn uh, as a part of that. Right, you've got that finding the people I don't know about yet, that predictive lead generation side. And then the opportunistic is one that I, I bring up as well, because it's something that small companies can do with simple reverse IP lookup that they're getting through their marketing automation system. Right? I can see potentially who the company is without them converting. Well, now I can actually go do some work in that big, shiny MarTech tool called Excel and start building a quick plan around that to start to execute on uh, as well. So these are all kind of things I'm happy to go deep with anybody who wants to talk in these more. So putting this all together for you. The first, go through your customer journey. There were like 10 hands that went up when I asked that question. Uh, I basically demand that the customers who come into our executive briefing center, I ask them that same question. And before we start any project, I make them go through their customer journey. I do this with my students too. And I say, don't tell your teams you're going to do this. You're going to find some areas that you're awesome at. You're going to find some areas you're really bad at and tackle them one at a time. Don't come to your team with, here's a list of everywhere we suck. Pick one right, and start improving. Incremental improvements over time add a lot of value. List out those key personas uh, that your company targets and really get into it. Where do they find their information? What content do they actually interact with? Then map out those existing touch points and your content that overlays on them. right? So that kind of, here's my persona, here's my customer journey, here's the content that I have that goes through that. Then call out your gaps right, in your content and your customer journey and build a strategic plan on how you're going to start plugging those. Because right now, those are gaps in that customer experience. You're, you're creating friction. You're not delivering the value that your customers want from you. And customer experience is a core differentiator for a lot of us. Because the best last experience your customer had anywhere becomes the expectation of the experience they expect everywhere as they go forward, right? Even in our consumer lives, we expect it. I had a great experience doing this. I, that's now the bar, right? And I expect that from everybody else. And any brand that's not living up to that bar of my best last customer experience is actually getting points against them in my kind of psyche as we go through that. So a couple other tips here real quick, because science is awesome, and I love science. Um, I'm going to throw a little. Uh, uh, psychology here at you guys. So there's a couple of key things you guys can turn around and do starting today. There's a concept called the paradox of choice. And I'll use jam as an example. There was a study done, basically, there's a bunch of jam on one end cap and three uh, choices of jam on a different end cap. While the bunch of jam got a bunch more traffic, had way less purchasing and conversion rates around that because people's psyche is overwhelmed by the volume of choices that they had. And it was overwhelmed them, and it was easier to not make a choice and walk away. 
versus if you presented them with fewer choices, they would actually purchase more. It had less traffic, but higher conversion rate. So simple thing you can be doing to help your customers' brains not be on overload is simplify your process and the choices that you're presenting to them. Make it easy. Another one called the default effect. Uh, we as human beings, the vast majority of us are what we call satisfying people. We look for the best value with the least amount of risk. Uh, which is kind of that aspect of that experiencing, right? What's my peer group going to say about my choices and decision? That feeds into this default effect concept, which is essentially looking at how I assume whatever the default is, is what everybody does. So that's a safe choice, right? This is why if you have an auto opt-in when the box is checked, you see huge signups on your emails versus if they have to check it to opt-in, then they assume most people don't check it. But you can apply this in things like the services that you're bundling into your packages. If you have them that they need to opt out of the services, we see this also as when you do like good, better, best, and this one's the most popular, you're helping people see what the default is. It's a key psychological principle that we can really take as we go through these different pieces here. And the last is the forgetting curve. And there's a study I really want to do around this a bit more, but we can start with this as a fundamental piece, which is the idea that after we're exposed to a concept, and you'll see it at this conference as well, after about three days, that drops off our brain. And so the idea of the forgetting curve is that you want to be in front of your customers in some way, shape, or form, even your existing customers and your prospects, at least once every three days as you're going through that. And so you want to stay that top of mind, especially as you're going through a sales cycle and things like that, um, which is why it's pivotal for marketing to be tied in with sales and actually know where the customer is in that sales journey so that you can continue dripping and feeding content to make sure you're staying top of mind. That could be simply an ad impression. That could be an email, right? There's lots of different ways to get in front of somebody without it being intrusive and seen as spam. But that's a core piece as well to stay top of mind as you're going through that. My last call out and challenge here to you all today is to be fearlessly authentic in your content. It used to be that you, every company knew its why. You knew why you were in business. You knew your mission statement. And that was just something you expected out of everybody. And everybody was doing it. But now it's actually become a differentiator to be honest and authentic to our brands, to actually say the reason we're doing what we're doing to help companies and why our products are great. Because we, when we start with our why and we find our why, we actually know kind of our purpose and why we want to move everything forward as a part of that. I've got a couple examples here I'd love to show you. You don't look like you're from around here. Warum bist du aus Deutschland? I want to prove it. Yeah. Welcome to America. St. Louis, son. Next time, this is the beer we'll raise. Never had an either. Dolphus Bush. So, all politics aside on that, because this was being created probably nine months before anything went crazy on that, right? Budweiser actually went back. And they were like, I need to tell my origin story. Why am I doing this? Because they found that that actually has a lot of impact. As a Northwest craft brew drinker, I, for about half a second, was like, maybe I should try that again. right? Because I was like, that's a powerful origin story. And that makes you pause and think. There's all about the Clydesdales and the horses and puppies, and that's all fun. But man, that gets you thinking about why they started, and it actually it did a great job of making people kind of look to pivot. I have one more example I'd love to share with you all as well. This process of about choice encourages the face of reality. The real question that needs to be asked, as well as answered, is what is it that we can do that is unique, that is impactful, it began with the question and a desire to make a difference. Can you hear me talking? <laughs> what we do impacts each and every one of us.
Technology has the power to unite us. That is something to be celebrated. When I lost my eyesight, I thought that my painting days were over. But the vision has evolved, and our mission is clear. We are going to empower every individual and every organization to do more. I built a computer and I opened a fridge even with a Lego. To achieve more, we can study black rhinos without disturbing their natural environment so we can help keep them safe. Technology has changed Braylon's life by opening up the world for him. It is a process of continuous renewal. It is about looking forward. Whatever I can do to help compute a cure for cancer, that's what I'd like to do. Thank you, Sue. And asking the question, what can we do together? no limit to how far we can go. If you dream big enough and believe in your dreams, you can make it happen. So I show that, I still actually get a little choked up with that one actually. Um, uh, that's my brand geek coming out there. Um, I show that that was actually done as much as an internal culture pivot for us as it was to try to re-educate people that we actually redefined and found our why again as a company, right? We needed our employees to buy into this vision and this journey that we were doing this to empower everybody to do more. And what did that mean? That wasn't just technology selling more stuff on a cloud stack. It was transforming lives, right, as we looked at that. Authentic content, if the one thing you take away from this entire talk, find your why, because authentic content and being authentic to who you are as a brand is the most powerful marketing that you can give to your customers and make a better journey, right? We saw the incredible video here of, as a piece of content that told the story of why this organization exists, right? We find that out, and that's the stuff that moves us to action. It really and it actually takes advantage of a psychological principle around emotion and, and building memories with people as well, but it all comes down to being honest and authentic. So my last challenge to you all is be fearlessly authentic as, as you move forward and think about your content. Here's my contact information. I will hang around after this, and we have another speaker, but thank you all so much.